And to, today we are looking at um, enzyme kinetics and enzyme inhibition. Yeah, definitely. Looking really at why some fruits uh, go brown, right? And the reason that, that fruits go brown is, is it, a, is it something that, that's good in nature or bad in nature? That's, that's the question we should ask. Is when, when, the, when you see a banana like this uh, looking nice and, and yellow like these, and then starting to go like this here, right? Uh, is that good for you, Sammy, or bad when it starts to go brown like that? I, don't know. I feel like when it goes brown, it's like just right to eat. Right. Right, but but then why did something like this start to happen in nature? In all the cells of the banana, in, in the vacuoles, you have uh, a chemical that collects, and that chemical that collects is called catechol or one two dihydroxybenzene. And when the cells of of a fruit or like or potato or apple or whatever it is, when these cells get ruptured due to some kind of damage to the fruit, then what happens is that these leave the vacuoles, this, this chemical leaves the vacuole, and then it goes into the cytoplasm where you have this enzyme, catechol oxidase, an enzyme that requires copper as a cofactor. But the question is, what is a cofactor? Helps the enzyme to work, yeah. right? Yeah. So, so there's a purpose behind this, but then What's the point of it forming this thing called benzoquinone? Well, benzoquinone inhibits microbial growth and prevents damaged fruit from rotting. So therefore, the fruit can get damaged, but it's, this is just like a way of getting some kind of antiseptic. Right? Catechol doesn't do anything. It doesn't react with anything. Enzymes don't react. Enzymes don't break down. What do, what do they do? Catalyze. Right, they catalyze. So we should use that whenever we describe enzymes. We should say that. And what's happening here, by the way? What's happening here? What would we describe this as? As this Oxidation. is going to this. The oxidized. What is being oxidized and what is being reduced? Is it Isn't hydrogen being removed from this thing? And it's being picked up by oxygen? And you get water. So what is that then? What is happening to, to catechol? Right? Because it's losing hydrogen. Right? Oxidation is loss. Reduction is gain. So it's losing hydrogen, it's being oxidized by this oxidase. Now the oxidase is catalyzing this thing. So that means that if we just had catechol out in the open air, and it's, it's got a certain characteristic color, like this here. But when it's out in the open air for long enough, without any enzyme, it goes to this color. Why is that happening? Why is that happening? What do you think it's happening, Judy? It's getting oxidized, but we didn't put any enzyme in there. Is it necessary to put the enzyme in there? No, no. it's just those reactions. Right. The, so the enzyme is just there in a biological system to, to speed up the, the rate at which something happens. So therefore, if you leave this out, and this is showing that this would be oxidized even in the absence of the enzyme. But if we extract the enzyme like we did today from, from bananas, and we put the enzyme in with the substrate, then we'd be able to investigate how changing the substrate concentration affects the rate of catalysis. What we'll have to do is we'll have to measure the disappearance of one of the reactants or the rate of appearance of the product. So here the product is something that is, is a bit yellowish in color, and then as soon as it gets exposed to the air, it goes to dark brown. This is what we call a precursor of melanin. So benzoquinone is just one of the building blocks that would eventually lead to the pigment melanin. So once this reaction begins to happen, we will start seeing a change in color. And if we see a change in color, then how can we measure that change in color and quantify it? We've done it before with lots, with a few different experiments. To make some dilutions of a stock solution of Catechol that I'm going to give you, which is 1.5%. So what you have on all the tables out there is 1.5% catechol. We uh, need to make sure that we don't get that stuff on our hands at all, so that whoever's handling it, and that should be all of you, should wear some protective gear because it's, it's poisonous. So from this 1.5% catechol, you will have to make some dilutions to get 1.25, 1.0, 0.75, 0.50, and 0.5. And then you mix 
into this uh, spectrophotometer cuvette one milliliter of the enzyme extract, which I will be providing you with from the refrigerator, and uh, three milliliters of uh, the substrate, which in the first trial might be 1.5%, but then you dilute and you get all of the other uh, substrate concentrations. Each time, though, you fill your cuvette to this amount. Within two minutes, you should get some kind of significant color change, and you place the cuvette into the uh, chamber here. Two minutes is all that we would have time for because we want to get like a lot of trials done uh, uh, fairly quickly. And then we would choose what wavelength we're looking for to, to check absorbance, looking at what color this thing has and, and, and where the absorbance is, and stick with that signature wavelength that we're looking for for absorbance. And then this would help us to quantify how much change there is in absorbance over two minutes would be an indicator of the rate of the reaction. So change in absorbance per unit of time would be an indicator of the rate of the reaction. And then on this axis here, we change the substrate concentration. In addition to that, we want to see what kind of enzyme inhibition would happen when we add an inhibitor. Inhibitors come in two types, right? the competitive inhibitor and the non-competitive inhibitor. So today we will be using this inhibitor, PTU, phenylthiourea. Phenylthiourea associates with the copper that's a cofactor in making catechol oxidase work. Now just from that information, you should already be able to hypothesize whether PTU is a competitive or a non-competitive inhibitor. Let's go back and say, what, what does it have to do if it's competitive? It has to interfere with the active site, fit into the active site. And if it's, if it's interfering with copper, then that's not the active site. So therefore, we should be able to get some data to find out if it is a competitive or a non-competitive inhibitor. And what we need to do is to add a small amount, just one drop of PTU. Well, this is affected by, once the substrate concentration becomes high enough, Right? then a, a competitive inhibitor would, would acquire the same rate with uh, once substrate concentration is high enough. But if you have a non-competitive inhibitor and you do all the trials, then you should get something like this. 